So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whenever you're listening to this. This is Matt Bailey alongside my critique companion, Crime Ricardo Medina. Hello, hello, hello. And this is another episode of Retrospect Reviews. And today we will be talking about um, arguably, easily, one of the, the most memorable, most iconic, most influential hood movies of all time. Of course, we're yes. talking about 1993's Menace to Society. Right. Yeah. Uh, the movie was released in May 26th of 1993. Um, right. And just my, my history with it. Like, I don't remember it being in theaters, um, but I don't remember it actually being shown on local TV. Um, I remember Boys in Hood was shown, and I actually got to, right. to see that for the first time on, on TV6, right? That was, like, the station when it comes to, like, the big heavyweight movies, huh? Um, yeah, but when it came to like, syndication, <laughs> you, you know, yeah. But when it came to Menace to Society, I saw it on cable. But I'm trying to remember if I saw the TV version of it. What I mean, TV version, of right. course, is where they cut all the graphic violence, where they center all right. the, the the cursing in really ridiculous ways, you know. Um, right. But I remember seeing the 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 uncut, well, the R-rated version afterwards on cable, and then um, saw it a few more times, and and it just stuck with me, right? Um, right. but it wasn't a movie that I, that I got back to, but, um, even, well, I did actually check it back, um, for this, uh, for this review here, just to answer that, right. just to ask myself that, just to answer that one question that I was had in my head, which was basically, does this movie still hold up to this day though? Um, right. is it still as powerful as it was when it first came out? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so before, before we jump into like the history of the, of the movie itself, um, what is your history with, um, Mercy Society? Yeah, I, okay, so that's uh, going to be, uh, you're, you're probably going to hear my opinion about it at this point, is that uh, it was the kind of slightly weaker version to Boys of the Hood in some ways. Um, you know, as I say that, well, watch well, we will be comparing, we will have right. to compare both movies, sir. Huh? Right. Can't and, talk and about it, it is a movie. talking about Boys in the Hood. Right, and uh, for me, it was, I totally understand why... You know, stuff like uh, Don't Be a Medicine, South Central, Why Drinking Juice in the Hood existed. Because, yes. yeah, Boys in the Hood is a pretty melodramatic movie. <laughs> Let's put it, it is, like that. It is, it is. Uh, um, especially. Yeah. But, I mean, but that, that was the style of it. And I think that's why it makes it, makes it so superior. Um, and I'll confess, right. like, the last five minutes of that movie alone, that conversation scene with um, with Cuba Gooding Jr. And, an ice, um, and Ice Cube still gets me. Yeah. Like, like right. near my tears. Swear to God, swear my right. tears is be is be creeping you know, creeping into right. my eyes when I see that yeah. scene. But yeah, right. And and, and in comparison to Menace's Society, you know, Menace's Society just kind of played theater like theater like in terms of the acting. Um, uh, like I watched it back to, uh, late, earlier today, uh, right. just as for this first. Uh, yeah, it was like oh, a lot of this. I I we were as far as saying hold up, but yeah, a lot of it does not hold up in many ways. Um, oh really. Yeah, for me, like it, it, it really looking back at it, it feels a bit amateurish. And if it, it is, it not the Hughes brothers first movie, right? It is, yes. It's their debut. Feature. Yeah, so it, it feels a little on the unpolished end of things, now. Right. Um, you know, in terms of like in terms of blocking the takes of stuff. That's just me watching it from a filmmaking perspective. Right, um, you know, they could have taken another take of the shot, mm. and I, that's what it felt like to me. Just generally unpolished overall. Um, in terms of who who doing what and why. Uh. Just general stuff like that. Nothing, nothing to break the film. I think is is a terrible movie or anything like that. But yeah, it. it I won't go as far as say it doesn't hold up, but it doesn't hold up anywhere near as good as I thought it did, um, expected. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's just my. And that's my history with the, with the movie is I was never really a big fan of the movie to start with. Um. I, again, to me, it was always the case that um, you know, boys, you know, this is the movie I remember. Not not to, you know, you remember Ricky. Yeah, I don't remember, remember what you mean. Remember Ricky, you remember um, right. Doughboy. <laughs> Shout out to Doughboy, by the way. Yeah, right. who, uh, <laughs> yeah. Who kind of refused to do to, to, to be part of this review because he, he's kind of indifferent to the movie. But yeah, to each his own. Yeah, yeah. To me, I, I wasn't that hyped over the movie, frankly, myself. Um, but yeah, you know, we, it's the anniversary we're doing it, so. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, okay. well, basically, I, I will talk about um, how this movie impacted me and why, to me, I think it still holds up. Uh, so just a, a little background, right? Just just a little back in time things to set up the scene for Mercy Society, right? So um, basically, in the 1980s, right, we saw, you know, um, we saw two black filmmakers really come out and bring back that, 
you know, bring that whole new African American filmmaking back to the scene. And those filmmakers were none other than Robert Townsend, who did a Hollywood Shuffle back in 1987, which is pretty good. Um, yeah. Though it, yeah. it doesn't hold up as much as it does, but you know, so many jokes and you know, a lot yeah, of a lot, a lot of yeah, a lot. You know, um, black actors and you know their their role, their play, sorry, in in um, in Hollywood, basically. Yeah, a lot of Townsend's material doesn't hold up in terms of being observational humor. Like at the time, you get why he would, you know, why he would be kind of a big deal because he's one of the first people to like actually pull it off. But yes. again, in, in comparison, retrospect now, like yeah, a lot of that stuff does not hold up all no, that well. No, no. no, I don't hate it by the stretch of the imagination, but yeah, yeah, uh, he's not, he was not person that. Yeah, he kinda, he kinda make a lot of enemies in terms of his observations and, and you know, the sad part about a lot of um you know, people on the outside who who coming up now is he as a as a filmmaker is that he kinda becomes a gatekeeper in their own way now. Like, yeah. you know, that's that has happened a lot with a lot of you see the black filmmakers a lot. Mm-hmm. So they they, t- they tend to be kinda behind the times in their own way, or they try to be gatekeeping in the, in their own way because they had to struggle in a specific way and thinking, Oh well, we I needed to do that to them now. Right. It's a weird relationship. It's, a, it's an unfortunate, you know, cycle of, I don't know what to call it, but just a kind of cycle of gatekeeping, more or less, you know, okay. that they end up encouraging. I, I, I'll, the, person, the person I'll put in that, that category, I'll probably put kind of Bill Cosby to a certain extent. Um, you know, one of the big reasons, other than, you know, the, you know, you know Bill Cosby behavior, uh-huh. um, he, he, was a, he, was a, he was a gatekeeper now, um, in, a, in a really unfortunate and insidious way, in my opinion. Right. That, that's how it came across to him, um, in terms of what he used to do, in terms of who he undermined, in terms of, I, I would suspect there's a lot of evidence he destroyed people's careers and whatnot. Anyway, so much aside on Bill Cosby, the point is, you know, observational humor when it comes to a race is something that you really need to um, adapt and adopt in really interesting ways. Right. Um, a, another example I'll put like that of a person who's not really getting or, or kind of seems to be here any times is uh, Chris Rock. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I'll put Chris Rock in that, in that camp. Like, Dave Chappelle is still somewhat prescient. Mm-hmm. Um, but but Chris Rock he did a stand up bit the other day and I was like yeah that shit feel, felt really dated like yeah, really although dated. although I like how introspective he got like he talk about his divorce and why it happened he, he got yeah. he got real so I like that it's like oh yeah. y'all, y'all been wondering well, what happened to me for the past three years here you go here is it's yeah. called tambourine and, 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 ticket yeah and, and yeah and, and one of the big problems part is you know is the I'm not black I'm OJ problem right you know you know when you get rich especially you kind of forget you forget. Yeah, and you kind of get detached from, of, kind of right. right. You get it, but you just get just generally detached of what's going on. Um, ah, right. And that that it really easy to happen though, um, for anybody, mm-hmm. for that matter. So you know that, that you know to, to, to see all this to see how Hollywood to see how Hollywood evolved in terms of its introspection, um, especially when it comes to race in in the, in the United States, um, is quite interesting. So to, to evolve from something like this movie to something like what Jordan Peele is, and you know what Jordan Peele might be in ten years, you're not sure, right? Right. You know how how relevant or, or he's going to be in in, a, in time going forward. Not sure. It's yeah. unclear. Right. And the second director was, of course, Spike Lee, uh, with his uh, debut right. feature. Um, she's got to have it back in 1986, right? So cut to right. a few days later, and Spike Lee basically just you know shocked America, you know for 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 better, not really for worse. Um, with his, and I still say his greatest work, do the writing. Um, okay. But f- I, I'm, I'm a Malcolm X fan myself, but I, yeah, I know. I, like, Malcolm, is still... X, Malcolm X is the epic. That's the, the true, right. you know, magnum opus. But do the writing right. just have that that timeless longevity? But it just has, you know, that yeah. thought provoke um, thought provokingness about it. You know that people will still yeah. be talking about for years to come. But anyway, um, so you know, thanks uh, to movies like that, and um, well, in 1990 with House Party, right? Which is still, yeah. you know, a fairly decent um, hip hop musical comedy. Um, you know, it just really showed that movies made by black directors are, you know, can be, can still be, sorry, um, you know, financially feasible. You know, they could still make money in the box office. It wasn't like a fluke back yeah. in the seventies with black exploitation. You know, it still continues on. Right. Um. <clears throat> so cut to nineteen ninety one, and a young director. I think he was twenty three by the time at the time when he made it, called John Singleton, changed the game with Boys yes. in the Hood. Which I still say is the best, you know, urban hood movie ever made. Um, what it did, it just really shone a light on, you know, what's going on, what was going on in South Central LA at the time. Um, it didn't really force it. It didn't really force its themes on the truth, but it felt so real and so life right. life like that. But what I really love about the movie, why it stands out so much to me, 
is that the characters even though you you do like for, for us we we don't know how life is in south central either we just hear it from songs and exactly movies, or read right, exactly. articles and assume that we know but that that's that's one thing that always bothered me with um with you know black you know it's black underclass so i want to call it black underclass but yeah black underclass black lower middle class in in a in the Caribbean, especially right. well in Trinidad, in particular, is, is how much we start to replicate their pathologies. Yes, you know, your, yes. American pathologies. And like, no, American pathologies are very specific and unique, and, and and unfortunate. I mean, we know why these things play out the way they did. I mean, I would argue that hip hop would simply never exist if it wasn't for the war on drugs, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, of course. Why these don't exist in the way we understand it? Most of these pathologies play out for very, very specific and very calculated reasons, for the most yeah. part, um, and. It, it, so, so um, okay, I forget the point I was going to make, but basically the, the idea is that how, yeah, okay, right, so our, our, um, our observation of this stuff is largely strange. It's not, not something that should be replicated or understood in any way people think they should understand it. Right. Um, and yeah, you're right about that. You know, that, that experience and that outlook is unusual for what you want to do or what you should be doing going forward, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of this policy or how to think about these things. Yeah, and, and that, that that's something that just kind of went missing for a lot of people for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but um, yeah, I was gonna say like for this movie here, um, what I really loved is how real these characters felt, because you know, to the untrained eye, to somebody who just hate rap music and just think all oh, rap music just promotes just violence and drugs and sex, you'd assume that right. every day is just you know, every day is a gunshot. That's the quote that that reggae song. You know that everybody just walking around with guns and it's just all about shooting people and taking drugs and stuff. And what Boys Hood really did is just show that, hey, um, there are real people who live here, real people who struggle, but they're still living their lives. You know, we have um, we have Cuba Gooding Jr. and Neil Long who studying to try to go to college. We had uh, Morris Chestnut, you know, who was trying right. to, who was deciding to, you know, he like he didn't want to do the whole college thing, but he wanted to play, you know, um, football. You know, we had um, right. Doughboy played by Ice Cube who was just like, well, I just kind of going through the motions, you know. But if anybody stepped to me and my crew, boom, you know what I mean. And it just right. really felt like you were there. You felt like you were a part of this community. So, and then you're, you're, you're really connected with the characters in, in some way, shape, or form. So when, you know, the, the really tragic moments of the third act hit you, you really feel for these characters. And most importantly, what yeah. I love about the movie is the whole coming of age tale, the whole boys to men um, trajectory of the story, you know, with um, Lawrence right. Fishburne being that, that, that powerful male figure and what I love about him is because 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 sorry because he he knows how the world works he knows how you know the hood works he's not gonna he he's, he could tell he could only tell his son so much right by the end of the day yeah. his son has to make decisions which is what he did at the very end so yes he yeah. went through that maturity and like I said you yeah, know, those yeah. last five minutes though gut punch man tears really well up you know we but you're right it really does have this melodramatic vibe to it but i think that's the reason right. why it stands out so much because it's so powerfully emotional you know what i mean um, right uh but uh, that's the thing you know th- in many ways i do that's what but that you, you, way you described is exactly why i think um this is superior to to medicine society um yeah medicine society is good and it but i don't know it's something about it just don't hold up very well it doesn't if for some reason it just don't stitch together as well i, I don't know if again the hughes brother just not as at, at the time at least not put to, not as skilled as john singleton like i think they, they went on to become fantastic filmmakers um I'll, but I'll i don't know just... i'll talk about that well you know well, right. I, I, as you say that but before i forget um i can't forget um also that came out in 1991 um new jack city which still remains one of my right. top 10 favorite movies of all time you know we could argue as right. to why but you know that was just a different right. side that was the the gangster movie you know the gangster no right know, right no but new, new, new jack movie, city was slash, you know yeah, New, New Jack City. I'll put on a, a kind of a higher level, frankly, um, than than even Boys Boys in the Hood and yeah, that's a, that's um, and a Men's different Society. movie. That's the thing. It was it was yeah, exactly. it was crime drama, but it brought in right, a exactly. whole anti drug message thing. So you know, it came right. at the right time. Of course, it was directed by right. Mario Van Peebles. Um, probably the best movie he's ever done. Period. And yeah, yeah, for real, huh? yeah. Um, but yeah, talking about the Hughes brothers, um, as well, talking about the Hughes brothers, right? Alan and Albert Hughes. Uh, this, like I said, this is their, this was their debut feature film. Um, they would follow that up with um, what I think is one of their most underrated works to date, um, Dead Presidents. Yeah, Dead Presidents is excellent. Yeah, I actually I, enjoy yeah. that movie um, somewhat more than this. But this is the big classic movie that they did 
yes, um, yes, yes. I don't know why, why does that Meta Society holds up so in terms of popular culture. I think it's just the reference points and thing. Like the one thing I always remember about Meta Society, it is the funniest part of the movie for me at least because it's so macabre how it plays out when the guy says, "You need help, dog." And yes, he finishes the <laughs> right. Yeah, there's this, I'll, this, I'll this talk about brutality. That guy a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah. But just just to round up the whole history thing, right? So yes, yeah. these these two these two guys basically um they were doing a couple they did a couple of music videos before and they were like well you know what here's what um we seen just how popular black films are let we let we take a crack at it and of course they were from LA anyway so it's like here's what let we just yeah. re- talk about where we come from our lives now. well not our lives but people that they know right um the history behind it was a little bit was a little interesting as well too because um there were certain rappers that were supposed to appear in the film. For one thing, that guy right. that you mentioned here, uh, who who it was in that scene, right? That you just mentioned there, that is um, MC8, who was part yeah, yeah, of yeah, um, right. Compton's Most Wanted. Um, he's he's one of the the most legendary West Coast MCs out there. Last time, well, okay, he had an album last year, I think it was, but I know the 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 recent time that I really heard him was on Kendrick's Good Kid, Mad City album. I was like, holy crap, it's him. Dude. Right, okay. But yeah, but, but okay, I'll, okay. I'll I talk about MC8 yeah. and uh, well, this, I'll, I'll, I might as well just spoil it. Um, MC8, could that do? Like, holy crap. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, yeah. I was actually surprised um, because I know he, he, he provided a song at the end of the movie called Straight Up Minutes, which still holds up in my opinion. But I was like, wait, but this man, the, like when it comes to bringing out the character, nah, he reminds me a lot like how Ice Cube did the do boy thing where it's like, yeah, you could believe I from the hood, right? You could believe that about me, you know? And he sold it, right. you know what I mean? But yeah, um, initially, his character, right, uh, who was called Ewax, um, MC Ren from NWA was supposed to play him, but what had happened is that he had okay. joined the right. Nation of Islam, right? Um, Spice One, another legendary um, West Coast MC, was supposed to play um, the character of um, KD or Kane Lawson, who um, instead is played by Tyron Turner. And... Um, I don't know if well maybe y'all could answer this in the comment section, but um, whatever happened to him, boy? Like I never saw him act yeah, in any other yeah. movie after this. It's just right. menace, and that's it. Um, however, yeah, Lawrence Tate, okay. no, Lawrence Tate. I was talking about Lawrence Tate as well. Right, this man like I mean, his career didn't be quite ridiculous, but yeah, though, but I'll talk about his character. But he was standing. Um, on the right. But what's so funny though? What's so funny is that he's like this. Afro- African American heart throb after this movie, like you watch the show and be like, "Wait, really? right?" <laughs> like I understand, but I just like the, the character. Charisma, the character still, played still. Cause he was in like Love well, Jones that's... and like the last show he was in was Girl Strip. It's like yeah, he he still had the looks and everything, but to think he started off playing O Dog do a complete mean? psychopath. <laughs> yeah, a complete psychopath was just weird to me. But yeah, you were saying about Lawrence. No, no, yeah, he, he became he became a, a workable, solid character actor, in my opinion. Um, from 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 uh from from after this film, I mean, I, I you know actually going back and seeing him and playing this role, I was like, oh yeah, he played this bad guy, he more or less, uh, this terrible character. Yeah, and he, um, and he was also but yeah, in, no, um, in in Dead Presidents, by the way. I thought his performance there was excellent. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 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 Um, but most notoriously, Tupac Shakur was supposed to be in this movie. Right. Uh, he was supposed okay, to be playing the, um, the the character of um, of Sharif, right? Okay. He's the the Muslim guy, or oh, sorry, the guy who was in jail and he converted to Islam and then he came out and he was just talking about. All right, right, right. Yeah, um, no right. To stop shooting each other, right. man, all that kind of stuff. Now, um, I did a Pinkett's husband, right? Or no, 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 not not him. Not my him. friend um, or baby? No, he was the guy. He was the guy who was lying with the other fella. Um, they were saying he wanted to go to Kansas. Okay. Right, 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 right. Okay, right. right. The ones that the, the, the fella that uh, everybody was teasing because he was always talking about that black power stuff. Right. So yeah, Tupac Shakur was supposed to be playing the character of Sharif, right? But um, well, according to the Wikipedia page, um, they actually brought him, well, actually hired him to play the role. But um, according to Alan Hughes, Shakur was uh, causing trouble on his set, and the reason okay. being is because um, well, he was angry for not being told why he turned Muslim in the first place. Why his character turned Muslim in the first place. So um, right. he was kicked off the set basically. Um, six months wow. later, um, I think I think it's Tupac ended up um, confronting Alan Hughes. I, I think it was at some place or wherever it is. And um, yeah, like assault the man, like like seriously beat beat the shit out of this guy, Jen. And wow. then had the audacity, right, to go on this UMTV Raps interview. 
and brag about it. Like literally going up in the <laughs> camera is like, yeah, I kick your ass, man. Blah, 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 blah. Like on screen. I remember the host, that was um Doctor, not Doctor Dre, and Ed Lover, like real holding him back and they're like closing mouth is like, dude, don't say that Dre on TV, don't say that, you know? Yeah. But even of course it kinda came back and bit him in the ass because he got arrested for assault and battery. And they actually played that tape of him being on the show and used that as ex- as a as evidence and like exhibit E basically, here you go. So, <laughs> right. Oh wow, you know? So that, that was crazy. Um but imagine if, if, if he was in that movie. Like imagine if Tupac had played um had played um Shuri Fair. Well not Shuri Freely, but if he had played Odo. I think initially he okay, wanted okay. to play O Dog in um, to begin with, right? Um but speaking right. of which, like I keep for why how can we forget um Tupac? We, how, how can we forget um Juice basically? Because that was another movie that came out before this movie here in you know, Mercy Society. And the right, impact yeah. that that movie had you know, especially with um Tupac's performance. I mean it was the first time well the first acting performance he ever did on screen and you know it's 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 iconic, right? But yeah, so um, this movie here, right, Mercy Society, um, I'll just kind of run through what it's about. So it centers on the life of uh, a kid by the name of Katie Lawson, or Keane as he's nicknamed. He's played by Tyron Turner. Um, he, lived, he lives in the Watts, sorry, um, and he's close to a guy named um, Kevin Anderson, or O-Dog, who's played by Lawrence State. And basically you're just seeing the world of Watts through the eyes of Katie, right? You're seeing yeah. how um, O-Dog is like, oh, how do you describe it in the movie? He's like the scariest nigga ever. He's young, black, and just don't give a fuck, right? Um, you see yeah. his relations with his friends as well who are involved in gang banging, you know, violence, and all that kind of stuff, and drug dealing as well too. Because yes, Kane does get involved in drug dealing as well. Um, we see a uh, flashback into his past. We see his... Um, his ridiculously violent father, um, played by Samuel Jackson, he, he's touted as, as as a special appearance, um, and boy, yeah. was that appearance special! <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but, but you see from the very beginning how he was brought up into this world of violence and drugs, because his father was a drug dealer as well. Um, you yeah, know, he saw his his first murder, which is at the hands of his father, basically, right? And, right, you know, yeah. just, uh, and you know just cut to some years later and now he's living with his grandparents they are uh, overly religious and he's kind of like you know what I just don't really care about that right now I, I just more concerned about getting paid and you know what not um, and in his life well the, the, the one well there are people who kind of give a crap about you know what he does with his life uh, for one thing we have uh, Ronnie who's played by Jada Pinkett of all people Right. So imagine if Jida was able to perform with her friend, or well, was her friend, sorry, um, Tupac Shakur. That would have been Tupac, pretty interesting. Right, yeah. But well, right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I know they I know right. They knew each other. You're right. Yeah. So um, Ronnie is the baby mama of one of Katie's father's friend, right? Um, friend, sorry, who is incarcerated. Um, he is played by Glenn Plummer. Um, and actually, come to t- well, as as I mentioned, Glenn Plummer. Um, he is well. Sorry, he starred in. Well, pr- I don't know why to this day, but this is like one of the movies, one of the hood movies that never gets brought up because I, I don't think a lot of people actually saw this movie before. Uh, by the name of South Central. So that's right. where the Dopey Menace to South Central got the title from. It's from that movie, South right. Central. Um, and you know, fortunately for me, I, I got around to, to seeing it. Um, the odd thing enough is that I only got around to seeing it once in my life, and I thought that it was a great film, in my opinion. Um, it's just really more like about a father son thing. Um, well, Glenn Plummer played the guy of OG Bobby Johnson, which is a name right. that you probably heard in a rap song. I, I can't remember what rap song, but I know I hear that name in a rap song before. And it was just him about his experiences in jail. And not wanting his son to follow that same partner. So it's yeah. kind of like him doing the same character. But this in this case, it's just like, I can't see my five-year-old son. Well, well Ronnie's kid, basically. Um, I messed up. I'm sorry. But he kind of gets the fact that Ronnie wants to move on. She wants to, to move from the hood. And she does yeah. seem to, well, later on, it's kind of established that she does have feelings for Katie, you know. And she wants yeah. the best for Katie. She wants Katie to leave the hood with her. Um but yeah, but basically it's yeah her. Um, we have the character as I mentioned before of um, 
of Sharif, uh, who is like I said, this guy who was in jail and then well he 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 um he got converted to Islam and then he's out basically and him and his friend basically are seeing that they want to move to Kansas. They just want to get away from the hood. You know, and he, yeah. every once in a while he'll show up and tell him, you know, you, you, you can't be doing this. You can't be involved in, you know, guns and drugs and all that kind of stuff. But at the same, but really and truly what this movie kind of boils down to is just the self-destruction of Katie. Because, yes, this guy just goes deeper and deeper into violence, deeper into, you know, the drug game and all that kind of stuff. Almost to the point that O-Dog is like the least scary character in the movie, you know. Um, and I'll talk about that parallel a little bit. So it just eventually comes down to, to um, to Keen just undergoing this this huge transformation, you know. Um, and then in the end, it just kind of ends tragic. It kind of ends the way how you expect it to end. But um, and I'll just jump into the review one time. Uh, I, I I won't lie to you, that ending still gets me by. Yeah, it's so it's incredibly haunting. But it's the narration that I love though. Where like um, there's a part where he says um. Or when my grandfather asked me, and he actually saw it in the movie where he say, and this is like the, 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 the theme of the movie, do you care if you if you live or die? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in the end he says, um, yeah, my grandfather asked me, do I care if I if I die? And I at the time I said no, but the, yeah, now I do. But now it's too late. But right. That just cuts so deep now. That's a great way to end that movie off. Um, but yeah, but but... I know you, you, you kind of mentioned this already, but um, what were your what are your thoughts on the movie? Just overall, this stuff that oh, you no, like, no, stuff you no, no, yeah, the, the movie's a solid film on its own. But again, in retrospect, I, I sure like back then it was a solid movie. But I remember it's a little cheesier than I remembered. That's all I've seen. Um, the the conversation on race has evolved so uh, much on on in the last twenty five years, in my opinion. That a lot of what they're talking about and what they're saying not as prescient as it could, was. So as a, as a film now, um, so the 25th anniversary doesn't like, sting or bite as much as it could have or should have. But yeah, right, the, the film right. does hold up quite, quite well. Um, and I, again, I did watch it, but it had, it had for me to not think about it and then have them not make references to the Wayans Brothers stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but, yeah. but good thing you bring up that too, because um, a- along with Boys in the Hood, um, another show that we have to talk about in relation to Mercy Society is Do Be a Menace to so Central and Jerking the Juice in the Hood. Um, right, which came out in nineteen ninety six. Um, I think it is one of the Wayans Brothers' best movies, yeah. um, just mainly because they just opted to go all all slapstick um, in their approach to hood movies. Now you know, um, and like it wasn't done in a way like they were just mocking the movies. Like, oh well, we don't care if you have a strong message about you know um, about. You know, violence and all that kind of stuff. We 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 just having fun here. But I mean, you 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 you, you can't. Ad- you, you have to admit it. Some there's some kind of you know tropes in these shows. Uh, we just gonna take these tropes and make fun of them. You know, um, yeah. And that movie in particular took a lot of <laughs> lots of references from the movie. Uh, for one thing, when uh, Marlon and Sean got arrested for being black on a Friday, that was right. that was in, that was a uh, um, them ripping off. Well, t- making fun of the scene. Where um where Kane and Sharif all of a sudden were just picked up by these white cops, beat up and then just thrown <laughs> in this um this Latino area. You know? yeah. Um another scene that they referenced so brilliantly in Dobi Aminas, um was that scene where um the guy who <laughs> showing up to um to the I think it was either uh, I think it was Sean's place, right? Sean Wayne's place. I was talking about how he got how, how he got uh, his sister's uh how he got his sister pregnant now. As a scene, right, scene right. that they do in in Mass, where it's like yeah. you got my sister, yeah. friend, the partner, and the same yeah. line, the same partner stuff now, and the way how yeah, it ends yeah. with, the, with the fight and how they, you know, that that thing now. Um, although in Domia Mass, they just went all out and have him literally stomp to the ground that he becomes right. one with um with the asphalt base um base cleaner. But yeah, yeah, um, but just that scene alone uh, with with um with that fella, right? was just one of the moments which really shows which really kind of culminate um kind of encapsulates sorry um keen self-destruction basically right because from 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 the beginning of the film he's 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 basically us he's like um kind of just seeing all these acts like for one thing it starts off with um another scene that was parodied in Dobia menace which is the, the the infamous um korean store scene right right um and how that turns out in the end of course with um with O-Dog 
you know taking this 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 um this not really like it, it it's kind of like a it's not really an insult but more like a comment basically where that where the the guy was like you know i feel so sorry for your mother and then he just took right, it right, wrongly right, yeah. and just shot the guy and you know all that stuff and then from there just took the videotape <laughs> and you know they started showing it for his friends and all that kind of stuff now so yeah they actually made fun of that in dobia menace although they, they they made it less brutal but more funny especially the whole right. hurry up and buy scene right um yeah yeah but yeah but you know fr- just from that fr- just from that moment alone keen is just like the observer he is he is the viewer he is shocked by what he has seen and we are shocked as well too but then eventually later on as he gets deeper and deeper in the game now is like he just becomes so so numb to this that he becomes one of those people as well he becomes so so devoid of emotion that he just kind of lashes out whenever he can you know um, right, right. And so, which is uh, and the ironic part about it is, is is nearing the time where he um, where he actually decides to leave. You know, is when certain things happen. And he's like, all right, I have to leave now. That's when the transformation kind of takes place. Um, for one thing, right. that guy is showing up because um, of this guild that um, that he was involved with just briefly, but then her brother coming and you know want to call him out now. And then after he got beat up, what well, he called he crew together, and then well kind of ends on this well then we just lead to that climax basically where we have that drive-by where um sharif got shot um and of course unfortunately um kd got killed as well you know yeah um but yeah basically just seeing that transformation just the parallel as well so i'll talk about that as um just the parallels in the movie that i really appreciated it for one thing um that that from the the flashback with him in the, the 70s right with his dad yeah. and you know what happens to the dad right the incident itself that takes place in the the house at the time where they was having the the um it wasn't a, it was nice. yeah it was, it was just a, party, a domino's basically. game yeah well the domino's game and then it was one of the guys right. coming back from the pen basically right so it was a party for him and then it was that argument with the guy and um and samuel jackson which end with the guy being shot and right. you know kane who's like five years old seeing this for the first time in his life but then prior to that no Okay. He comes outside and the well, his friends are outside there. Uh, one right. of which, at, one of which is uh, well, the the guy who got incarcerated, right? And the first thing he does is like, you know, um, <laughs> one of them actually gives him some some alcohol, now. and then afterwards it's like, yeah, I want to see, I want you yeah, have um, let, let me just see that gun you have there. So just his fascination right. with that stuff now, and then afterwards the mom calling him and saying, you know, get inside the house. If you remember, you see that again later on. Yeah, where they have any party again where they go in a wee party. And yeah, with the daughter, 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 but once mm. again, if you're thinking about it from Kane's perspective, it's like, eh, well, I had to survive. Eventually, he has to learn, eventually, Ronnie's son, sorry, has to learn how to survive now. So, if right. I am the, if, if, since technically I am the father figure here, I'm going to show him what to do. So, I'm going to show him how to hold the gun now. I'm going to show him how to use it, basically. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do what my dad did for me. You know? Right. Um, but the subject of that, though, um, and then also to in terms of Odog, you know, who starts off being this real wild and crazy guy, you know what I mean? And yes, he is wild, right? Um, he just does not care about anything or, or anyone though. And I'll I'll argue about his character in a bit. Well, I'll argue that his character, sorry, is a little I don't over want to say top. animated, but just a little too over the top now. Because again, yeah. they really want to show the true ugliness now of, of living in the hood now. So he created in this guy who, yes, he has charm. Yes, he could laugh and drink and smoke with the rest of them. But gosh, man, that 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 scene with the crackhead, though. Yeah, which, that's of brutal. course, the <laughs> reference in in Dobie and Menace as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which in that movie and in a kind of vulgar note, but here is just like, well, you just kind of shoot the guy in broad daylight. You know, like, jeez, like, yeah. really? Yeah. I, I think yeah. to me, if if I'm not mistaken, that's like the last really like true brutal thing that I saw him do. Afterwards is just um, Keener and his descent basically in, in into that lifestyle. Um, but yeah, but I but as far as performance go, I think that Lawrence he kills it here. 
I think that he is Odor. Like, I can't imagine anybody else being Odor. And the mere fact that he looks the way he looks now. And then when you talk about it later on in his career, where he will just play, like, these, um, you know, these, these charming, you know, Afro-American characters now. But then when right. you think about, like, him being in this movie, the way how he looks, it's just like, way, way. That makes it even more scary, in my opinion, right? Um, yeah. I thought that Tyron Turner was great as well, but, yeah, you know, for me, I wish I could, like, have, like, a full, dis- uh, sorry, not a full discography, but a whole filmography of his movies, so I could say, yeah, this is his best work, because, I, like I said, I haven't seen him in anything else. So I don't know if he, right. if he got better as an actor. I don't know. I can't really say. Um, right. But I love... But I love the fact that we had these uh, voiceover narrations, which, by the way, um, the Hughes brothers had that in because they were inspired, of course, by Martin Scorsese movies like um, right. Streets and Goodfellas, two movies which they referenced, which they were inspired by actually to make this movie. And you could, you could see that in terms of just these characters, um, knowing that they want to be good, you know, knowing that they want to be kind of righteous, which is like the message of Mean Streets. But because they in this lifestyle, it's kind of hard to do that, you know. So with, with Keen. You know he wants to do the right thing, but to him it's just like, yo, I had to make money, Jet. So if it if it means I had to be selling drugs, if it means that, you know, I had to do a little bad thing, then so be it. But then, yeah. really the inciting incident is not so much the um, it's not so much the the Korean store incident. It's really when his cousin gets shot. Yeah, right. like, yeah. That was him, the yeah. that that really really put him on edge. Then. Um, and even that scene they kind of reference in in Dobi and Menace. Well, the hospital scene they actually reference there, right? Um, yeah, the just, parody. Yeah, the parody there. But is the you know them going back for the guys early on in the film, you know, and just seeing him in the car with uh, with O Dog and um, Ewax, who is played by MC Eight. And I love this scene though, where um, where Kane is just basically talking about, yo, I don't know if we should be doing this, man. Yo, this, 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 that, that, that. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't want to be shooting up no no women or no kids now. Yeah, and yeah. O-Dog is just like, yo, I'm to you, boy. Like, I find you, I find like you, you're not up to this shit. Yes, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. to you. Like, yo, they, they shot at your cousin, Jen. We supposed to clap back at them. This is how it is. But I love just that nice, it's, it's, it's just the, the little things about this movie that I love. It's so where Ewoks come and say, yeah, boot all. Yeah, oh, I'm talking real shit and this shit. Yo, better hush up your mouth. <laughs> I don't need to do this job now. And then, yeah. of course, when that scene happens and how it plays out, is like like he was saying at the very beginning, is how Ewoks responds like, "Yo, man, you need some help." <laughs> like that, though. Like that is some like high level experience, um, gang banging brutality. Just, like to do something like that. No, but, like when you think about it, like geez. Um, another character we forgot to mention too is Chauncey, who's played by um, Clifton Powell. You may remember him right. from um, Next Friday and Friday After Next. He was that loud mouthed. Um, I was about to say the uncle for a sec, but he was the owner of Pinky's Records. Right, if you remember yeah. right. So, yeah, he was there. <laughs> and, you know, he was just there kind of hanging out with everybody. He would do certain jobs. Well, they kind of set him up like this carjacker character. Um, I love this scene where this white fella shows up to his house and he's like, yo, well, what is you doing out here, Dred? You know, it's one o'clock. And I was like, but yeah, you told me to come for this time. I was like, I don't care what it is you tell me. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you didn't right. even you didn't even have the you didn't even had the um the, the, the goal to be coming in my hood just so you come and tell me you want me to get this car for you, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh so yes, as I mentioned with this car, yes, there is a scene where O Dog and Kane are trying to, to you know, gang in themselves like, oh, into yeah. car jacking basically. And they get caught. Um now we get to that popular scene boy, probably the greatest scene in this whole movie. Yeah, Bill it's Duke, probably and the best shot scene in the movie as well. My god, that three sixty shot by um, yeah. You know, well, before we get to that, right, right, when, so, when Bill, Bill Duke came in, I thought it was great when he um oh when when he sits the arrows, down when he was shadow now yeah he, the shadow of and the silhouette he sits yeah. down and I love how he just puts the badge and the gun on the on, on the table yeah so were you there at the Korean store at eleven twenty five it's like yeah yeah and, and he, I, I believe Kane and how he was stumbling it's like yeah well I I, I I was there and you know. And you you dropped the bottle at that time, right? So how come nobody came right, to, right. To, to to clean it up? So you were there at twelve twenty five, right? He's like, yeah, I was there. It's like, haha, you, you see what you did there? You know you done fucked up. Yeah, right? yeah. You, you see, you see that, right? <laughs> and he just repeats that. But I was like, jeez, boy. But 
get into technical stuff in a bit. I love that 360, you know, camera uh, um, shot that they use here. For yeah, one thing, what, what I love about it is that you just hear in Bill Duke's voice mostly. Yeah, Chuck and Chuck's good, yeah. Him, you're not really, they're not really focusing on him because the camera just moving away from him now. But you're hearing his voice and you just feel in this presence, like the whole room itself, even though it's an interrogation f- um, room, feels like a prison ship. Like there's no escape. Yeah, yeah, they make it work, yeah. I love that, the light and everything. But just that famous line, yeah, 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 you, know, you know you're doing fucked up, right? You know yeah. that, right? <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But yeah, so uh, just, just from that moment, just that, that wake up call, and then of course that moment where I mentioned before where the cops arrest um, him and and um and Sharif. You know, this those two things were just basically the wake up calls for um for for Kane basically. Um right. and then he kinda well oh, oh yes, I forgot to mention too another another famous actor was in this too. Um Charles S. Dutton. Right, yeah. Yeah. He was well, you know, we, we all know him from, from TV's rock from the early nineties. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that god awful Alien Tree movie. But anyway, um even though Well, I mean I, I love the scene that he has, right, in the in the um in the classroom where he's talking to Sharif and um and Kane. Where and this is where we'll get to the whole teams that you that you were seeing you you find already hold up, which is like you know you are a black man in America, right? You were the pre right. so you know you only have to do one thing and that's survive. You know, and right. it's played off so dramatically, now. But then I was like, well, you know what? It's the nineties, right? It's early nineties. It's those kind of teams, anyway. You had stuff like that um, in those movies uh, uh, before, like for example, in Boys in Hood, for example, that scene where Lawrence Fishburne is talking to the old guys and talking about, well, you know, well, gentrification, basically. You know, why why they buying up property and why they have like, right. a liquor store and a gun store and all that kind of stuff. That scene yeah, where yeah. he was talking there, it reminds me of that. So you always have those moments where you have to get a little political. So that was that was that moment there. Um, but yeah, but just performance wise, I thought it was great throughout. Um, yeah, I, I really really felt the performance by by Tarantino. I thought he was great, and you really feel and you really could uh, not connect really, but you really his his part to self destruction feels believable. You know, he is arrogant. He will listen to people, but he is arrogant, and they kind of set that up early. You know, he would laugh when Odog shoots a guy and whatnot. But then, you know, when he himself gets in trouble, it's just like, well, you know what? I I don't know. Anymore. I'm not really sure about this anymore. Um, even from the first time he got shot, uh, when he got shot, actually, with that scene with um, with his cousin getting shot as well, you know? Wake up calls. But, you know, still, once again, it's just like, whatever, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and one scene that, that really kind of best shows that was, of course, the double burger with cheese scene. If you remember that, yeah, 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 yeah. that's with the cracker, yeah. No, no, not not that one. The the one where he oh no no wait, right when you when you when you rob right when you rob him when you right yeah with yeah, the um like, with the drive through with cheese man <laughs> yeah with the drive through right there. no no okay yeah and like I don't know like look at it now is like that just so cold blooded like you you you, you know? <laughs> really right, on the edge there but like jeez but like you have these people tell you don't do this kind of stuff Jeff, but you're still be like you know what I have this car Jeff, but. I want this man rims, you know, but it, but you know, to to him it's just so easy, you know, because he has a gun and because he has he knows he knows what to do. That's why he could get away with stuff like that. And then once again, based off of what his um his his grandfather asked him, like, do you care whether you live or die? And at that point, though, well, you know, within the 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 end of the second act, of the end of the movie, just like, no, I really don't care because. You know, just to get political, is like, you know, the government don't care about us anyway, so it's like, whatever, I could do whatever I want to do. Um, but, you know, just, but bef- well, of course, one thing about this movie, though, that stands out, and I think this is one reason why people did not like the film as much or wouldn't go back to it, is the level of violence so, in, in the film. Like, I would not lie, the, the, the first couple of times I saw it, I was, I was genuinely shocked by how violent it was. Um, and then when you compare it to movies like, say, you know, Juice and, um, and Boys in Hood, it's just like, this is like boring on like rated X level, you know, whereas it almost yeah, feels yeah. like it's, it's glorifying the violence itself. But then watching it again now with, with, with more mature eyes, is like, all right, um, now I understand why some people would kind of stay clear of this movie because it's, it, 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 to them, they, they think it's probably glor- uh, glorifies violence. Um, 
but I don't think it does. But it's more like a heightened sense of things. Everything feels right. heightened from the way how um, Keen looks at life, the way how he narrates, the way how he talks to the audience, to just the stuff that he sees. You know, just the like what happened with the, the crackhead, for example, the him rubbing the guy for the um, for the rims and all that kind of stuff. It feels so yeah. heightened. There. But then, like, um, like which is kind of scary but kind of ironic as well. You know, people who lived that life, people who who lived in that area would you yeah. know defend the movie and say yeah this is how it is this is how it used to be or maybe still is so to us now because we're not from that community we watch those scenes and be like whoa are they, are they just going way too far with the violence you know like from yeah, yeah. you know just just these scenes of violence all of them basically you know are, are shocking in some way shape or form what is the korean scene well i'm sorry the korean store scene to when samuel jackson's on screen to you know the end of the movie itself you know it it's shocking right um but Chuck, in any sense, to me looking at it now that, yeah, these things do happen. These things have happened before. It's not fabricated. It's not imagined. It's not like some white guy thinking, hmm, you know what? These rap songs... And, and good thing as I say that. Because um, like they will look at that and be like, hmm, these rap songs, everything's, you know... We should do something like that, man. We should do something like how these rap right. songs are, you know? But no, but yeah, it's, it's but, a case. It's a case of it's a case of art imitating life. I mean, that yeah. is what it is. Uh, exactly. Exactly. The rap, the rap, the rap stuff come after the fact. Right. Uh, but but yeah. the beauty of the movie, the beauty of the movie as a whole, is that for people who just hear about these things on wax, hear about these things in rap songs now, I'd be like, wow, okay, you're you're just doing this for shock value. You're just doing this to to, to sell records. When they could come and say, "No, well, no, this is actually the truth. This is what happens here," and this is well, and you know, as, as I say that, I love, 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 love the tagline for this movie, which is, "This is the truth. This is what's real." So you don't have to believe that stuff like that happened, but the directors know it happened. The people involved in this film know these things happen, and they are just showing you this, um, showing you this stuff on screen. So yes, we will look at it and be like, yes, this is going too far, the brutality of it. But I would I would kinda defend the show and be like, well, it never goes too far, you know. It it kinda reminds right. me of um perfect perfect comparison for this is um City of God. Yeah. yeah right. Which first time I saw it I was I was shocked by the violence of it. But it's never it although it may come off really stylized and heightened, it's never to the point that you know, it's glorifying it too much. They, you always see yeah. the flip side to it, and you know they do that here with this movie. You see the flip side. You see the side effects of these things, from that guy getting beat up because he was talking about oh you got my sister pregnant, to that drive by that happens in the end, and look at what happens there. You know, there's always a consequence to these act- actions, even right down to the whole Korean um, store scene. There's a consequence to that, and you know, this on a slight little tangent here. Uh, I think even the directors themselves will go out to the way and say, well, you know, you have these action movies out there, you know, Steven Seagal will do all these kind of things and y'all wouldn't complain. Right, right. If you right. show a movie like this, y'all want to call it controversial and want to ban it. And there's even a scene in, in Menace where I think it's Old Dog saying, yeah, I want to be a movie star. I want to be like the next Steven Seagal, you know? That right, kind of yeah. thing. And that was, it was a little on the nose, but I was like, yeah, I, I, I get where they're coming from there. But um, your, your thoughts on just the, the, the content, the violence in the movie? Oh, no, no, it's, it's something that not uh, not particularly um, impressed by in that sense. Like it was never an issue for me. It's like yeah, I, I went on City Darkest Cut. That is what it was at the time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Again, to be in in retrospect, is something that do hold. Not I won't say go hold up, but it's it not as shocking as it was. I, I would confess that. Like. Yeah, it's it's not as shocking because you know what to expect anyway, so it does not. Really but this 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 was me. done in a time where where people are super hyper over violence in media. You yes, know, this yes. is the, the age you know when Mortal Kombat was the worst thing ever, and you know <laughs> that shit. Yeah. So, right. So I could see why at the time of the film coming out, it would have been like a really big deal for people. Of course, and then and then of course the big excuse is you're glorifying this. How how are you how are you um, fixing the problem by showing this? You know. Right. But. The movie wasn't really like the movie wasn't really going um wasn't really going out of its way to say, hey, violence is bad, guns are bad, you know. It's showing you this is how life is, right? And it's expecting you, the audience, to be smart enough to realize, hey, 
this is a part that you could go you could go down but we're not telling you to do that right we are tr- we're not treating you like kids here you could watch this movie well i mean be it, like, it, again, eh, i want to go around and shoot people between. but that's up to you but this is not what we're right. telling you here so you gotta be smart to figure it out right but yeah. it's one of those cases of you know people conflating the melodrama with the didactic nature of it. it's not didactic it was never meant to be that um it was just like well it's pretty on the nose in terms of the violence that's why um, that, that, that character, um, Udo. Uh, what's his name? Udo, yeah, Udo goes over the top, but not like that is the character, like whoever. It's up to you to accept that or not. Yeah, like I don't know. For me, for me, it's, it's kind of hard to accept that there really are people like that who will just go around. No, I, and I, just I, I'll tell you, I, I, I'll and tell you. Of, of a dime, I like. It, I don't know. It's just kind of hard for me to believe that. But you know, once again, some people would say, some people who live that life or who live there would be like. Yeah, that people like that, dude. and that's scary when you. Right, I straight up will tell you, I know people like that. Like, you know, people that that level of sociopathy, right? that they just this no care attitude, they don't business about nothing. You know, this kind of they give up on life. Kind of is is like the worst mindset of of religiosity and, and nihilism at the same time. Like, you know, people they super they super superstitious. Eh? Don't get me wrong, they're very superstitious. Right, but at the same time, they super nihilistic. Right, they just give up on their life. They don't care about nothing. That nonsense, no. Yeah. And that that is an interesting like direction or take you could do with all of this going forward, no. Right. Um, and how you want to think of that, or wh- whether or not you do want to think of it at all. Um, with these characters, no. So I don't know. Yeah. All right. So a few more things before we wrap things up, right? Um. So shockingly enough, the movie got um a lot of positive reviews. Although there were some people who felt that, you know, the movie was um, playing into, you know, hood cliches, of course, you know, the gang banging, right. you know, the violence, you know, you know, the drug dealing, all that kind of stuff. And I would, I would kind of, I would kind of defend, I would, I would say, like I would defend the show and say that it's not, but I would say that it does follow certain tropes, certain cliches. Like, okay, it's one thing that, um, that Keen is involved in, you know, just the, the gang banging stuff, right? But, um, oh, I, ha- I don't really have that much money. Say, what I gonna do? I gonna hook up with my friends. They have some coke, so I just gonna deal some coke. And <laughs> that one moment, even though they had one of my favorite NWA songs, Dope Man, it was just a little yeah. kind of cliche. It's just like, well, hey, we have to bring in some drugs here. So, yeah, I, I knew how to how to cut up drugs and all that kind of stuff because movie, you know? If you're honest, I was saying. But, um, but no. still, uh, even more amazing was the was the response that Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel the great um, critics gave it like they gave it two thumbs up um, they put it in their um, list of best movies of 993 which is amazing actually because yeah, yeah. They, they, they get the message they understand what the movie was doing and where it was uh, coming from and that to me is why I think that movie still holds up um, at the time I was just like okay well, maybe the violence is a little too much but just watching it again with with, old, with more mature eyes now it's just like okay now now I really understand what they're getting at um, I yes. would I would agree with you. Yes, it does feel dated at times, um, especially you know the kind of stuff that they're talking about. You know, oh well, I want these Daytons and all that kind of stuff. But it's more like a time capsule. That's how I see. Like these are how the times were. You know, um, whether it's the music or whether it's yeah. just the the kind of things that the characters were talking about. Um, and speaking of music, I forgot to mention to MC8 um, as he was. Yeah. I thought that he he stood out in this film. Um, it's not like you know Ice Cube from from um, Boise Hood where he was an integral character in the show. He was just a guy that you that just used to to, to hook up with um, Old Dog and King. He was the more the most experienced out of all of them. Now. Um, but yeah, as, as far as music goes, you, you get that whole West Coast G funk kind of music. Um, I love yeah. MC8 song that closes off the song um, the movie Street Up Menace. That song itself and you know the pianos and just how downbeat it all sounds just fits the movie perfectly because yeah this movie is bleak it's dark it's menacing <laughs> if you think about it um there's hope but there's not too much hope in it but you know the way how it ends though it's it, it's a fitting end i think it's, it's a is the perfect way to end that movie um in comparison to something like say boys you heard where it ends on a sad note but there is you know a little glimmer of hope when in the um the the text basically that shows up before the end of the movie where it's saying how um with Cuba Cuba Gun Jr. and the Long's characters eventually went to college. But right. before all that, you saw what happened where Doughboy died a week later, you know? 
he buried his brother. He bur- he buried his brother, um, Ricky, and then a week later, right. he 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 got killed. He was shot in. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, but in closing, though, I would say that you know both. Well, yes, Boise Hood is easily the better of the two movies by far. Yeah, it's superior. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it. it, it it's just because of that dramatic weight alone, and of course the music. Of course the music of um, in it is incredible. I love it, um, but just the characters and be- because you connect with them so much, and with the exception of um, of Ice Cube's character, everybody else wasn't really out to just shoot people down. You know, it was just that his character was just part of it. You know, but everybody, but right. everybody else wasn't really part of that. And that's what I love about the movie. Just playing against stereotypes, right? But this one here, because of how brave it was, because of how it was just willing to really show you how it is or how it was back then, you know, is is incredible. is is is, is an amazing feat. Um, <clears throat> technically, I would say that um, yes, I do agree with you. Like, it does feel a little rougher on the edges, and you know, it is the Hughes brothers' debut feature. So yes, it's understandable. Um, I felt that a bit like some of the transitions were a little too like they could have they could have tightened up the, the, the transitions a little bit. Some scenes were were edited a little too quickly, some sequences, sorry. But they do try some cool things like the, the camera panty left, you know, with the scene where um where Kane flips out on the guy who was who was touching up Ronnie and he was beating up on him right. and you know the lightning was flashing. Although I have to admit, looking at it now, oh gosh, lightning flashes. You know, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean. So let's just have this 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 strobing light, and that's that's our lightning flash. It's it's kind of cheesy, you know. But you know, yeah. once again, it's it's Hollywood. It's it's filmmaking back then. That's how it was, right? We bought it, right? Um, I felt that acting wise, like I said, it's on point. Writing wise, yes, the dialogue is raw. It's authentic. It feels real. It's very vulgar, but you know, it's it's the dialogue there. Um, but it just kind of adds to your, the authenticity of, of the of the story itself, now. Uh, yeah. But yes, apart from the, from the graphic content, I think that you know the message is still there. You know, it's it's not really hitting you over the head and telling you, well, you know, you're not supposed to do this. It's just showing you this is how life is, and you could make of it whatever you want to. You could choose to do that if you want to or not. That's up to you. But we are smart enough to tell you. We we are smart enough not to tell you. You know what to do. This is not this type of show, um, right. but I think at the end of the day, I think this movie still holds up. I think well, part has to, has to do with that content alone, and just how raw it is. Because honestly, like like prior to this, I haven't seen any hood movie that ever went this far. Though it doesn't go too 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 far. And for, uh, fortunately, sorry, um, because it's not that type of show. It's not glorifying that life. It's just showing you what it is. Um, yeah, but it's to the point that sometimes you just really have the question whether these things are real or whether these things have happened before. But hey, this is a story, so whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I think the movie still holds up. It's not. It's. I wouldn't say like like I said, boys. It is still the, the best of the hood movies. But this one, I would say, is like a like a top five for me. Easy top five. Yeah, it's pretty me. good. Yeah. yeah. So um, for me, if I had to read this, I would I'll give this a like a decent four and a half out of five, man. Um, I, right. I think it's it holds up. Um, considerably well, not not by a lot, but you know, considerably well. Um, also, too, I would say it's if you if you find boys here, it's just too melodramatic and too sad and everything, and you just want more more visceral. This is like a more visceral version of 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 boys here. Like if boys here was just aiming for your heart, this one was just aiming for the gut. But like this one is yeah. visceral. It's raw. It's real. It's unforgettable by far. So. Yeah, I, I, I will say it is one of the best hood movies out there and still one of the best, I should say. And if you haven't seen it, yeah, definitely give it a look. But if you're the type that don't really like those kind of shows, then yeah, I really can recommend that you check this out. But yeah. Uh, so last words on Mercy Society. Yeah, I, uh, I give it a 7 out of 10 type score. No, right. Nothing major. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's still solid. Um, a lot of it, this still holds up, but a lot of it doesn't. And mostly because the, the, the language and the debate has somewhat evolved in terms of uh, where what race is in the United States. And I suppose that is why it's, it's held back a little bit. Um, but whatever, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. So with all that being said, Ricardo, where can we find you online, sir? Um, Passat, R-M-E-D-Y, that is at R-M-E-D on Twitter, and then Ricardo Medina on Facebook. 
All right, you can also find me on Twitter. Just look for Legally Black MGB, MGB a capital letters. You can also find me on Facebook. Just look for my name, Matt Bailey, along with a Legally Black blog official fan base. So you find a link to this podcast here, as well as the others that we've done in this retrospect review series thus far. And of course, our BS Beats and Bailey series. Also, I'm on Instagram. Just look for Matt Bailey reviews. And last things last, if you have any thoughts on Messy Society, if you think the movie holds up, if you think it's just way too gratuitous or it's just too too hood for you or if you just think it's a masterpiece or, you, or god forbid you think it's better than boys you heard you know just feel free to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about this film here right. and yeah that's pretty much about it so once again guys good morning good afternoon good evening good night whenever you listen this, this was match Bailey and ricardo medina and we are signing off from another episode of retrospect reviews so until the next one take care peace <laughs>